Hi there, Smart Drivers, talking to you tonight about passing your road tests, the skills, abilities, and techniques you need to be successful on passing your driver's test first time. There we go. Okay, pass your driver's test first time, skills and abilities and techniques you need to be successful on your driver's test. And for those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s, hauling freight between Canada and the United States. A very different world. <laughs> at that point. Uh, we did not have cell phones. We did not have GPS. So we basically worked off pay phones. That is something that is now in the museum, which is kind of crazy to think that 30 years, uh, pay phones are all gone. Uh, when I was in Australia, they still had pay phones, but the pay phones in Australia were now free. They didn't take them out. They just made them free, which I thought was an awesome idea and good on Australia for not taking out their pay phones. So yes, we navigated with a map book and if we got lost we had to find a place to park a 75 foot truck and with a payphone and go in and call and ask for directions uh 1997 in a bid to come off the roadway uh, because long haul truck drivers are gone for a week or two at a time uh, i became a licensed commercial driving instructor and started teaching people air brakes how to drive a bus uh smarter defensive driving with semi trucks and whatnot I uh, went back to university 2006, graduated with my doctorate in legal history, which is a study of policing, courts, and prisons. Uh, my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. Uh, while I was going to university, drove buses for Greyhound and one of the regional bus lines there. And in 2015, started the Smart Drive Test online business. And it has been wildly more successful than I could have ever imagined. Uh, 300,000 subscribers this year we're going to hit, uh, 50 million views, uh, just absolutely incredible. Over a thousand videos now on the channel and we have helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people to get their license and be safer, smarter drivers. So really, really awesome. Uh, new videos last week, conditions that create black ice and as well survive the freeze, how to dress in layers, how to put on clothing that will keep you warm in sub-zero temperatures. And this is primarily directed at uh, truck drivers who are working in the uh, Alaska in the Northwest Territories, uh, strapping down loads, <laughs> driving on the ice roads and those types of things, teaching you how to get warm or not get warm but to stay warm because once you get cold you can't get warm again so make sure that you dress so that you stay warm okay uh and have a look at that video it's a great video uh i did shoot it a couple of years ago but we've re-edited it i've brought an editor on board and we're working together and i think that the editing is at a much much higher level it's really really professional and i am very appreciative of jd and his work that he's doing to help bring Smart drive test to the next level. So have a look at those videos. All right, first thing uh, that you need to do to get your driver's license, your first driver's license is you need to do a knowledge test. There is a little bit of a eye test uh, to be uh, eligible to get your driver's license, but you need to take a knowledge test of which you need to get 80%. Most tests are 50 questions of which you need to get 40 of the questions correct. The test includes, uh, sorry, I'll back up. The test is multiple choice. Uh, one question, uh, four possible answer answers, and this is where my tagline comes from. Pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer, because you may think that the answer is right, but it's not the best answer of the four, and that's what you want to pick is the best answer of the four. So, topics covered are all in the handbook. Signs, signals, road markings, terminology, complex intersections, painted on the slip lanes, attitudes, uh, winter driving, driving in inclement weather, all of this language is what you need to know for the purposes of taking your driver's test, taking your learner's test, and being successful. Uh, you need to understand right of way, who has the right of way, which is a, a complex way of saying who goes first at an intersection, at roundabouts, complex intersections, uh, intersections in residential areas, controlled intersections, uncontrolled intersections, and what is the driving task, okay? What are you doing when you're in the vehicle and you're driving? You're dealing with <clears throat> drivers, with vehicles, with traffic, with different roadways, and you're dealing with light and you're dealing with different weather, and this is all the stuff that you're going to ask you on your driver's test. Every driver's test has four components that you need to 
be competent in to be successful on your driver's test because you're going to deal with social driving when you go out on the roadway. However, if you participate in social driving and you drive the way that everybody else on the roadway is driving, you are not going to be successful. So you have to do differently what everybody else is driving, okay? Speed management, you need to control the speed of your vehicle, posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. Space management, you need to <clears throat> control space in front of your vehicle, three to four second following distance, and you need to stop in traffic so that you can see the tires of the vehicle in front making clear contact with the pavement. That is approximately one vehicle length between you and the vehicle in front of you. Okay, observation, you need to have a scanning pattern in place. Your scanning pattern, your forward scanning pattern ties in with your speed control. So people ask me all the time, how much over, how much under can I go above and below the posted speed limit? You need to be very close to the posted speed limit. And with today's cars in this day and age, anything in the last 10 years, it's going to be pretty easy to stay pretty much on mark with the posted speed limit. And it's in tied tied in with your observation pattern. If you are up and down and all over the place on your speed limit, it tells the examiner that you're not scanning properly, all right? Reversing, you gotta do a 360 degree scan out the, around the vehicle and you need to look out through the back window when you're reversing, okay? You can use your mirrors, you can use a backup camera, but you have to be looking out through the back window for the duration of your reversing. Communication, the five ways that we communicate with other traffic, other road users is uh, position of the vehicle, position of the road user on the roadway or in relation to the roadway, okay? Lights and signals, hand gestures, eye contact, and the last one is the horn. In North America, the horn is seen as a sign of aggression, so you wanna use it sparingly. <clears throat> Learn faster, okay? When you're first learning how to drive and you first get in the car, Focus on your slow speed maneuvers. Reversing, parallel parking, three point turns, reverse parking, two point reverse turns, U turns. You need to know all of these maneuvers for the purposes of your driver's test. Don't do just the minimum. Don't be one of those people that's like, oh, in my state, we don't have to parallel park because we're so cool. And then you don't go and learn how to parallel park. The bottom line is if you go out and learn how to par parallel park and you do the hard work, you are going to be a better driver overall. You are going to learn to drive faster. It's like my karate sensei used to say, any idiot can do it fast. To be able to do it slow takes skill, ability, and technique. And these are the skills, abilities, and techniques that you need to learn to be able to drive a car. So focus on the slow speed maneuvers, focus on the parallel parking, your three point turns and backing into a parking space. Every driving test, except California, Maryland and Ohio, all have those three maneuvers, parallel parking, three point turns and reverse parking. And it's up to the discretion of the examiner if they get you to do any of those other ones. U-turns or reversing around a corner, which is called a two-point reverse turn. So know that for the purposes of a, of, of a driver's test. Okay, requirements of the driver's test. Holding the vehicle in the lane, observing, shoulder checking. If there is one skill that you need to be successful in passing your driver's test first time, shoulder check, shoulder check, shoulder check. Okay, you must uh, be competent in shoulder checking and every time you change directions of the vehicle you need to shoulder check you need to signal it's that simple don't make it more complicated than it is okay you need to respond to changing driving conditions your job in a driver's test is to demonstrate to the examiner that you have due care and control of the vehicle in changing road and traffic conditions nothing more Nothing less, okay? And if you're in doubt, the traffic situ situation gets too complicated, too overwhelming, simply stop, okay? And you need to deal with unexpected events. Corey will put up the video for you on unexpected events. Emergency vehicles, yellow lights, uh, crashes, uh, large vehicles stopped on the roadways. These are all unex unexpected events that happen kind of every now and again, and you may or may not encounter them during your training but you need to be able to handle these changing traffic conditions and show the examiner that you have due care and control of your vehicle. More abilities for a driver's test. Two hands on a steering wheel for the duration of the test. And I've had a number of questions in the last few weeks about 10 and two, uh, nine and three, or eight and four on the steering wheel. Which one of those do I do? It doesn't matter, okay? 
It doesn't matter if it's 10 and four, it doesn't matter if it's nine and three, and it doesn't matter if it's eight and four, so long as you have two hands on the steering wheel for the duration of the driver's test, okay? Unless you're sh shifting gears and you're taking your driver's test in a manual transmission. Two hands on the steering wheel. Different designs of vehicles will dictate you have your hands on the steering wheel in different places, okay? So some steering wheels would be more comfortable at nine and three, others will be more comfortable at 10 and two, and some will be more comfortable at eight and four. And there was a whole fad some years ago about eight and four, which is completely uncomfortable and does not give you maximum control of the vehicle. The reason is because airbag deployment. And this was true when airbags first came out because when airbags first came out, they would almost take your head off because they were coming out at 300 miles an hour. You're going forward at 50, 60 miles an hour, whatever the speed the car is going. And the two of you essentially collide inside of the car. Airbag technology in second and third generation airbags is much, much better. So you're coming forward, the airbag deploys. By the time you get to the airbag, the airbag is already beginning to def deflate and actually cushions and protects you in the event of a crash. All right. So stopping in a line of traffic, I already talked about that. Uh, stopping in the correct position at, stop, at controlled intersections, behind the stop line, behind the crosswalk line or sidewalk. If those two conditions don't exist, then the, the edge of the road just before entering the intersection. You need to deal with yellow traffic lights. And I have a number of people say to me, oh, if you jam on the brakes at a yellow traffic light, you're gonna get rear-ended. Well, if you get rear-ended, you made a mistake a half a block back because you were not observing the intersection, you were not preparing for the light to turn yellow, and you were not aware of what was behind you and how close that vehicle was to you behind, okay? So if you're preparing to come to a stop at a yellow light at an intersection, you can tap your brake lights to warn the person behind you, hey, goofy person behind me tailgating me, back off, you're too close, okay? And Trust me, if you tap your brake pedal a couple of times and flash the brake lights in the back of your car, the person behind you will be aware and they will uh, back off, all right? Uh, controlled and uncontrolled intersections, you need to know the difference and you need to know the difference at right of way. New drivers get confused between two-way stop signs and four-way stop signs. And the way to know the difference between these two types of stop signs is a four-way stop sign, all-way stop sign will always have a little square rectangle under the stop sign that will tell you that it is anything but a two-way stop signed intersection. All right. Slow speed maneuvers. After you've been driving for a while, you're getting close, a couple of weeks out from your driver's test, go back and revisit the slow speed maneuvers, the parallel parking, the reverse stall parking, three point turn, as I said, these are a requirement for any driver's test. And yes, smart drivers will come back to me and say, listen, when I took my driver's test, I didn't have to do a three point turn. It is up to the discretion of the driving examiner if they get you to do parallel parking, if they get you to do two point reverse turn. It's up to the discretion of the driving examiner. If he or she has a bit of extra time on their hands, they may take you out and get you to do a three-point turn. They may take you out and get you to do a two-point reverse turn. So know that it is not a fixed test, all right? Okay, driving lessons with a driving instructor. The return on investment is really high. Yes, they're expensive, no doubt about it. Most driving lessons in Canada now are more than $100 an hour. I'm not sure what they are in the States, but perhaps some Spark drivers could indicate what they're paying for driving lessons. You can take a whole class, okay? So you can sign up for 10 lessons and then you go in and take 10 lessons with a driving school. Individual lessons, you can just take one or two here and there as you feel that you need them. And then you can sign up for a mock road test or a practice driving test. It is really valuable. If you go out with the driving examiner, uh, he or she will take you on the roads where you're gonna be taking your test and they will actually do the slow speed maneuvers that you were required to do for your test in the exact same location where the driving examiners do that. Now, no, the test routes are not fixed, okay? Driving examiners have 10, 12, maybe 15 different routes that they can take you in and around the driving test center. And this is why I say to you that you need to practice in and around the test center because they can take you anywhere, okay? And they have many different types of test routes. So know that for the purposes of your driver's test, all right? Get as much practice as possible in the time leading up, in the months leading up to your driver's test. 
practice in as many different vehicles in the month or six weeks before your driver's test, stick to the same vehicle. But if you're farther out than six weeks, drive as many different vehicles as you can. Okay, practice in as many different driving environments as you can. Practice driving at night in the rain. Practice driving in the winter time. Practice driving on the freeways. Practice driving going to the grocery store. Get as much practice as you can. Uh, this picture you can't see because unfortunately the overlay is above it. Uh, her dad had taken her out on logging roads before she even got to me. So basically she already knew how to drive and it was just a matter of me giving her some tips and techniques to pass the driver's test and her ability to drive the vehicle was uh, exceptional, okay? Because she had practice, a lot of practice before she actually got to taking her driver's test. All right, the good, the bad, and the ugly. The good, the bad, and the ugly is that sometimes good drivers fail the driver's test and bad drivers who you think are not gonna pass the driver's test in 100 years go in and on the first time pass the driver's test because everything in the driving environment goes swimmingly. Nothing goes wrong, there are no unexpected events, and everything goes according to formula. Good drivers, on the other hand, uh, they have to deal with a crash. They have to deal with an emergency vehicle. Uh, the traffic lights are out at the intersection. Everything goes wrong, and unfortunately, they make one mistake that's a uh, automatic fail on a driver's test, and they're not successful. Do not take the decision of the driving examiner as who you are. It's not who you are, okay? If you're not successful, you just book another driver's test and go in and get your license and pass it on the next attempt, okay? And no, driving examiners do not have a quota of how many drivers, how many students they pass, how many students they fail. And they do not have an 85% fail rate, okay? They have other people that they have to answer to. And if they have a 50, even 30% fail rate, the their manager, their supervisor is going to call them in and say, hey, what's going on here? We need to fix this. We need to do something about this. Now, for those of you in Europe and in UK and in London taking your driver's test, yes, some of the test centers in London, we're talking about the big London, not the London in Kentucky or the London in Ontario. We're talking about the big London in England. Some of those test centers do, in fact, have a, have a fail rate of over 50%. The reason is it's an old imperial city in combination with the fact that students who take their driver's test in London are driving manual transmissions. So it is way tougher for them than it is here in North America. We have big cities that grew up with the motor car and you're driving automatic transmissions. So the driving test in North America is much easier than it is in Europe. Okay, practice your driver's test, book your driver's test, uh, book your practice driving test with your examiner uh, in three weeks out, uh, book it seven, 10, 10 days before your driver's test. And if you're gonna take a practice driving test or a mock driving test with a, a driving instructor, uh, do that. The return on investment is really high. And as I said, they will give you uh, tips and strategies, skills that you need to improve for the purposes of being successful on your driver's test first time. So rebuilding confidence. All right, all right, focus on the fundamentals, focus on the slow speed maneuvers, those will make you a better driver overall. Learn the basic, and as uh, <laughs> luck favors the prepared, you must master the basic skills and prepare for the opportunity of passing your driver's test. The night before your test, get a good night's sleep. Uh, bring documentation, glasses, and money, prescription glasses if you need, if you those are required for you to wear to drive as well. Bring sunglasses if it's going to be a sunny day and you need to wear sunglasses. I need to wear sunglasses when I drive. It is a myth that you can't wear sunglasses on a driver's test, okay? Back into the parking stall unless signs prohibit you from backing into the parking space at the test center. Uh, some test centers obviously will not have an office in a parking lot. You just pull up along the curb and wait for the examiner to come out as in New York City and keep going on the driver's test until the examiner tells you to stop, okay? Don't focus or perseverate on an error that you may have made during the driving uh, portion of the test, okay? The driving examiner may or may not even have seen the error that you thought you made. So just take a breath and keep going until the examiner tells you to stop. 
Your job is to take away the driving examiner's to fail you, uh, right to fail you. Nothing less, nothing more. That's all you need to do to pass your driver's test. Good luck in your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Uh, Ryan is here. He's got some questions about uh, securing vehicle so it's not stolen uh, because unfortunately it was stolen. Fortunately, Ryan, the good news is you got your vehicle back. Minimal damage because unfortunately uh, my mom had her vehicle stolen and she didn't get it back with minimal damage. It was completely written off uh, because they had done a lot of damage to the vehicle. They'd crashed it, left it full of junk and those types of things. We will give you some tips uh, about securing your vehicle. The um, the bad, there's good news and there's bad news about having your vehicle stolen. The good news is there are things you can do to have your vehicle, to prevent your vehicle being stolen, okay? Park it in a well-lit area. Make sure that it's locked. Don't leave the keys in it. Don't leave valuables in your vehicle. Uh, make, sh uh, make sure all the windows are rolled up, right? All of those kind of basic common things that we may or may not check when we're <clears throat> parking our vehicle because sometimes we're in a hurry we get out we get relaxed those types of things so make sure that all of that happens when you get your vehicle in now i have as you know i have the buggy the 1998 honda crv uh it's old i do have power locks in it but i don't have a key fob right one of the things i do when i park the vehicle is i will go around and check all the doors on it make sure that it's locked because sometimes every now and again it won't lock one of the doors and so you know if you really want to make sure that your vehicle is secure this is one of the things you want to do is go around and make sure all the doors are locked make sure the hatchback is locked make sure your valuables are all stowed and make sure that all the windows are rolled up okay it's in a well-lit secure place and some of the other things that you can do are uh, get a steering wheel lock because as you said it was a 1997 RAV4 Toyota RAV4 manual transmission right so that's the good news you can get one of those locks uh, steering wheel locks you can put an alarm in it uh, there are some other uh, types of locks brake locks you can get a, a stick shift lock as well so there's some ways that you can prevent your vehicle being stolen now that's all the good news the bad news is that if these are professional car thieves they're going to steal your vehicle regardless and if you have one of those locks on the steering wheel uh emily says she has a club now they've done studies to show that the club the steering wheel lock that you put on your vehicle slows down professional thieves we're talking about professional thieves by 20 seconds yes 20 seconds because they have uh, an electric grinder a little electric grinder and they cut the steering wheel take some 20 seconds they take the club off they throw it in the back seat so figure out <laughs> whether those are good for you or not uh so uh rawson says his mom is a fan of manual transmissions <clears throat> i am definitely a fan of manual transmissions and for anybody under the probably under the age of 30 uh manual transmissions are going to be a vehicle theft deterrent in and of, of themselves so if they were able to get in your vehicle, steal your vehicle, start it and drive it away, these are professional thieves that we're probably dealing with, okay? So, and so one other piece uh, about having your vehicle stolen, uh, I was reading something a few weeks ago on theft prevention. The most people had their vehicles, a high percentage of people had their vehicle stolen by family, family. <laughs> cousins uncles sisters uh parents whatever uh knew where the keys were for the vehicle came and simply took the vehicle and stole it they also knew where the spare keys were so do not keep spare keys on your vehicle if at all you can prevent that all right uh ryan says yeah my sister got her catalytic converter on her 1997 honda crv before even my mom's equinox got stolen uh <clears throat> yeah catalytic converters the unfortunate part is right now all of this is going to increase vehicle thefts uh catalytic converter thefts because we are in a in inflation and people are on hard times and when people are on hard times unfortunately crime rises and this is what happens uh they have i've read things i would need to do a little bit more work on this this is kind of off the top of my head is that vehicle thefts are at an all-time high so make sure that your vehicle is secured uh, you can buy catalytic converter 
uh, security devices and those types of things but the bottom line is is if you know these people are professionals they're going to steal your vehicle they're going to steal your vehicle so that's the good and the bad of having your vehicle stolen and securing your vehicle protecting your vehicle making sure that it doesn't get stolen do the best you can but like i said if they're professional thieves they've they're going to steal it uh on that note my business partner uh his truck they also have uh, professional thieves also have key fobs they program key fobs and they simply drive around an area and they will continue to click the key fob until they get one of the vehicles to unlock uh, my business partner's truck has been broken into twice with these key fobs, these uh, key fobs that the professional thieves make up and they go around and they click them and then they open the vehicles. They don't steal the vehicles, but they go in them to see what they can find and see what they can steal. So that's the other thing that professional thieves do as well. Uh, Pierce is here. Hello. Uh, uh, Vanilla is here and uh, Mallory, we had wind and rain here yesterday and today we've had a mix of rain and snow. And yes, they're getting snow in Ontario. We're not getting snow here uh, in mountains yet, but it's on its way. Uh, Queen K is here. Uh, KK is here. Sean from Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And Emily from Toronto. Hello. If you're just tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me know what class of license you're going for. Uh, if you want to be a safer, smarter driver, we can help you with that. Give you information, tips, tricks, and strategies to do all of that. And, uh, and Rossin says he's working on getting snow there in Ohio. Slothy, millions of people failed the test. Uh, Slothy, that's not true at all. Millions of people do not fail the driver's test. Millions of people pass the driver's test every day. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the stories we hear about people failing the driver's test all the time is kind of like negativity in our society. It's very easy to get wrapped up in the negativity of our world. There's so much negative stuff going on right now. The war in the Ukraine, the war in Gaza, uh, you know, what's happening with our governments, uh, you know, embezzlement, uh, all those types of things, terrorism and whatnot. However, Millions of people pass the driver's test every day, and you can too, okay? Uh, Ryan, how long should you be driving with a Class 5 license before going for a Class 1 license? Uh, Ryan, it depends on where you are in the world, because different states, different provinces have a minimum age for you to pass your drive or before you can take a class one license so it will so look at the driver's handbook for your state or province and it will tell you what age you can go and apply for a class one license slothy i see it was so easy back in the 80s when i took the test uh slothy it was probably a bit easier back in the 80s when you and i took our driver's test but they still required scanning. They still required speed management, space management, observation. All those things were still required at those times. Yes, there are more hoops to draw, to jump through now for sure in terms of this um, the graduated licensing program. But millions and millions of people still pass their driver's test every time. And for those people, those students who are learning to drive with driver's education here on YouTube, uh, other driving instructors and whatnot, uh, the pass rate is like 95%. It's really, really high. So it's only the people that are not getting uh, <laughs> the proper education, the proper information about driving. Those are the people that are not being successful on their driver's test. Uh, slothy safety was more lax. Yes, there was less attention to safety in the 1980s and prior to that, for sure. Uh, Ball, uh, I am awesome. How are you, my friend? Awesome, awesome. Adrian, how much do you need to step on the brakes for the brake light to light up? Uh, excuse me. Uh, basically, you just tap the brake and the brake lights will activate, okay? You do not very need to touch it very much. Actually, if you wanna flash your brake lights, you probably will not even engage uh, the brakes on the vehicle to, uh, to have the brake lights turn on on the back of the vehicle. Uh, Ross, and do you do the knowledge test be first before the driving test? Yes, you do. No, you, you do it weeks and weeks and weeks before because most places in most states, most provinces, you're going to have to have a knowledge test and you're going to have to have your learner's license before you can actually get in the vehicle and drive it with a mentor, with a driving instructor. Okay, so know that. Uh, and then you're part of the GLP program, the graduated licensing program or the GDL 
Okay, so you need to have that uh, before you can even get in the vehicle and start learning how to drive. You have to have a learner's license for whatever class of license you're going for, regardless of new vehicles, of whether it's a uh, class one license, semi trucks, straight trucks, ambulance, bus, those types of things, whatever that is, you have to have a learner's license. Uh, Ryan, in my opinion, having knowledge to fix cars and knowledge of the automobile parts, how it works is enabled to component, uh, uh, competent with driving. Yes. Knowing how to, how the car operates, uh, what a petrol engine is, uh, you know, drivetrain, the electrical system, the fuel system, uh, the buggy has been getting a lot of work done to it this week. And yes, it is helpful to have that information when you're learning how to drive a car. It's not essential. But some of the fundamentals, some of that fundamental information is really going to help you out when you're learning to drive for sure. Uh, Pierce does everything while driving is always being responsible, including social driving and fundamentals. Uh, yes, but social driving is not being responsible, okay? People who are engaging in social driving are doing what everybody else on the roadway is doing and they are not engaging in safe, defensive driving, okay? If you want to be a safer, smarter driver, you need to not do what people are doing uh, when they're engaged in social driving because people who are engaged in social driving are following too close, they're speeding, they're not coming to a complete stop at stop signed intersections, they're driving over painted islands, they're policing other people and they are reactionary in traffic because they're following too close. They're not creating conditions following space behind other vehicles so that they can read and respond to traffic because space buys you time, time buys you options, and options reduce crashes. And that's what you want to do for the purposes of being successful on your driver's test. Uh, Mary and I was driving today at every intersection just as I got to the crosswalk lines. The lights turned to amber. It was funny. Uh, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it, Marion? <laughs> Where some days you'll go out and you'll drive and you get to the line and every light turns yellow or you or you get out there and you're driving along and every light is red. Other days you'll go out there and every light is green and you're like, what? What is going on? It's like, especially when you get those days where you hit every light red, you're like, I think there's somebody in front of me who is stealing all the green lights. <laughs> that happens for sure. Uh, Gabriel, if you have a permanent... A permit for another state, you can pass the driving test. Yes, but you, Gabriel, you have to go into the state if you move to a different state. So say, for example, you, you got your learner's license in Missouri and you moved to Maryland, you have to go into the DMV at Maryland and you have to change your license over and they will give you another learner's license and then you will continue on in the Maryland uh, GDL system to earn your license according to their... Uh, parameters and their rules and their policies, okay? Uh, Ross and I will be doing my test uh, in an automatic transmission because I am more comfortable with the automatic transmission. Yes, and most people in North America because automatic transmissions are so widely available, you're not going to have to do your driver's test in a manual transmission. Unfortunately, that's just for people who live in Europe and people who live in the UK. Uh, Ryan, controlling emotion is one of the important keys for me when I drive. And yes, it's one of the important keys for everybody <laughs> when they drive. Controlling emotions because when we become emotional, we become reactionary. And not only to become reactionary to what other people are doing in the driving environment, we also become retaliatory. Now we're going to follow too close. Uh, we're going to tell them they're number one, we're going to flash our lights at them, we're going to honk our horn, and we are going to tell that other person that he or she did something wrong. Because the other part of social driving is that we police other drivers and other road users along the roadway. That's what we do when we're engaged in social driving. Uh, diamonds, I have my road test two weeks, uh, please can you advise? Uh, yes, absolutely. Diamonds, go back, have a look at the presentation but for the purposes of passing your driver's test you need to have four basic components in place okay space management you need to stop at the correct stopping position it's at controlled intersections before the stop line uh, before the crosswalk or sidewalk if those two conditions don't exist then you need to stop at the edge of the road uh, before entering the intersection so Corey's put up the video for you there on final days thank you for that Corey and I was remiss in 
introducing Corey at the beginning of the uh, live stream here. Corey is the moderator, does an excellent, excellent job of getting up the videos that I suggest you have a look at uh, for further information on being successful, answering the questions that you ask. And as well, Corey does a great job of keeping out the bad people as well. Those people who are <laughs> like to spam you. Once you get to a certain juncture on YouTube, a level of success is people actually spamming you on your live streams. So, uh, so the first thing, space management, uh, you need to have a three to four second following distance and you need to stop and traffic one vehicle length back from the vehicle in front of you. Your landmark for that is you should be able to see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. And the reason we say space management is because if you're not near anything, it's less likely that you're going to hit anything, okay? Next one is speed management, uh, posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less is the speed that you're going to drive. And then observation, you have your forward scanning pattern in place, down the road in, check your center mirror, far down the road, instrument panel, far down the road, left wing mirror, down the road, check your right wing mirror. Okay, so that's your forward scanning pattern and that ties into your speed control. So if you're all over the map in terms of your speed and you can't keep it consistently at 30 miles an hour, if you're in a 30 mile an hour zone, that tells the examiner that you're not scanning properly. So scanning pattern is tied into speed control. As well, reversing 360 degree scan around the vehicle. You're gonna look out through the back window. You can check your, uh, backup camera and you can check mirrors but you can't use them as your primary line of sight so you need to look out through the back window when reversing uh, lane changes shoulder check um, mirror signal shoulder check look okay look forward again minimum three flashes on your signal okay one click two click three click look again check your mirror space is still there then you start moving over leave your signal on completely from one lane into the other lane and then cancel your signal when you're completely in the other lane and you have to speed up slightly as you're changing lanes and moving into the other lane of traffic those are your observation skills and as well signal shoulder check every time you change direction of the vehicle both forward and in reverse okay not just forward so if you're backing into a parking space you need to signal that you're backing into the parking space as well for the purposes of your driver's test the last one is communication and i was actually surprised about this i asked a question on the community tab a few weeks ago about when do you signal and <laughs> I did not realize that so many people, so many different drivers had so many different ideas about when you signal, okay? And people even had a go at me about saying that every time you change directions of the vehicle, you have to signal. And they're like, well, if the road curves, then you have to signal according to your rules. And I'm like, every time you change direction of the vehicle, not when the road changes directions of your vehicle, okay? <laughs> so anytime that you're changing lanes, anytime you're turning, every time you're moving in a parking lot, you need to signal. And then of course we got the hundred feet thing. Uh, we've got quarter mile thing, eight mile thing. Uh, you know, all these different ideas about how far before the turn you actually signal. If you want easy about signaling, it should be 10 to 12 flashes on the signal before you turn. Okay. So once you figure that out, what 10, to, how much distance 10 to 12 flashes is on your signal. That's how much you should be signaling before you get to the turn. And of course, this is on my list of videos that I need to make because, oh, I love things that are controversial in driving. So we're gonna make a video on how to signal and when to signal, okay? 10 to 12 flashes of the signal, three minimum before you change directions of the vehicle. And yes, you need to signal in parking lots because signaling is communication and it's a backup okay because you did observe you did look around oh there's nobody around but you made a mistake because you were tired and you missed that person standing in your blind area and you didn't signal which is your backup because it indicates that maybe the other person should do something because remember driving is a social activity we need to work together to reduce traffic crashes all right the last piece of your driving test is communication. As I said, position of the vehicle, position of the road, your road user in relationship to the road or on the road. All right. So 
If the vehicle is in the left turning lane, there's a high percentage, high possibility that that vehicle is going to turn left. If the road user, if the pedestrian is standing close to the crosswalk at the intersection, there's a high probability that that pedestrian is going to cross the roadway, okay? Position of the vehicle, position of the road user, lights and signals, eye contact, especially if you're walking around, okay? Because I do not trust vehicles when I'm walking around and I walk a lot. I get eye contact. I'm figuring out what they're doing. <laughs> Hand gestures, come on, come on. Don't tell them they're number one, especially on a driver's test. And then the last one is horn. Use your horn sparingly, okay? Because it's seen as a sign of aggression. So four components to pass your driver's test and be successful. Space management, speed management, observation and communication. You have to have those four components in place to be successful on your driver's test, okay? It is busy today on the live stream here. So if I miss your question or I don't get your comment, uh, just put it in again and I'll, I'll get back to you. Uh, Larry, I am battling 850 on your short questionnaires. Oh, batting 850. Awesome. Thank you, sir. Winter tires are mandatory. Uh, yes, on some roads, uh, Quebec has a winter tire law. Uh, here in British Columbia, we have certain highways that you cannot go on without winter tires. Uh, so yes, some places do have a winter tire law. However, most places will allow you to have tires that are either have M and S, M plus S, S, which is uh, mud and snow, and as well the mountain snowflake symbol on the tire will allow you to drive on those roadways. Uh, Epic, my friend, in Australia, Europe, United States, commercial driver's license, you need to be aware that automatic transmission restricts you to an automatic. Uh, therefore, take the manual gearbox to avoid being restricted. And Epic is absolutely correct on that. If you get your CDL license with an automatic transmission, you cannot drive a manual transmission in a big truck. Now, most big companies in North America are all going to automatic transmissions because they're having difficulty getting drivers. So if you're just gonna work for big companies, that's fine. But if you're gonna run in the mountains, the Rocky Mountains or in West Virginia, they're not gonna be running automatic transmissions. And if you're running heavy in Michigan, Texas, other states that allow uh, more than 80,000 pounds, you're running uh, wide loads, heavy loads, those types of things. Uh, or you're running Super Bs here in the West, which they love their Super Bs here, which are two trailers uh, maxed out at 63,500 kilograms or 140,000 pounds. Just, just, just ponder that for a minute. 140,000 pounds. Your little Kia weighs 2,200 pounds. Just ponder that for a second. 2,200 pounds versus 140,000 pounds. That thing runs over you, you're gonna be squashed like a bug in your little Kia. <laughs> 140,000 pound truck. Isn't that just, that's just like mind boggling, isn't it? All right, uh, Rawson, have you heard of blind spot mirrors that you can add on your mirrors? Uh, yes, Rawson, little convex mirrors you can put down in the, you can stick on the bottom of your mirrors and those will definitely help you uh, with seeing into your blind areas. However, they do not eliminate shoulder checking, all right? You still need to shoulder check. Uh, Ryan, hopefully you can give tips to prevent car thefts, uh, stealing your vehicle. Uh, Ryan, I did give tips <laughs> and we'll just reiterate those, okay? Make sure that your vehicle is parked in a well-lit, secure area, okay? Make sure it's locked, all right? Don't just click the fob and walk away from it. Go, actually go around and make sure and check all the doors are locked, okay? Make sure all the windows are rolled up. Make sure that all the valuables are put away, okay? Uh, make sure that you do not have a spare key hanging off the vehicle somewhere or in a magnet box stuck to the vehicle, okay? Do not... Leave your keys out where other people can find them, especially relatives, because I was reading something uh, a few weeks ago on the internet that one of the police uh, services, I think it was Kentucky, was saying that most vehicles are stolen by relatives. <laughs> Cousins, uncles, aunts. These are the people that steal vehicles the most because they know where you keep your keys. So, uh, all of that, you can buy security devices for your vehicle. Uh, Emily said that she had the club, 
which is a steering wheel lock. You can get devices that lock the steering wheel. Uh, you can get car alarms to put on your vehicle. If uh, you have a 1997 Toyota RAV4, uh, you can get a lock that will lock out the uh, the gear selector on the vehicle, all right? You can get the, all of that stuff, all right? That's the good news. Now, the bad news is if you have professional thieves who want to steal your car. They're going to steal your car regardless, okay? There isn't anything you can do about that. And the unfortunate part is is that we're in a we're we have massive inflation globally. All right? And when we when the economy goes bad, car thefts go up. And unfortunately, they've gone up. All right? Now, the club, the steering wheel lock which Emily said she had, that slows down car thieves by 20 seconds because they have a little electric grinder and they cut the steering wheel on other side. So they take the thing and they throw it in the back. All right. Uh, the other thing about uh, the club, these very heavy steering wheel locks uh, is that they're dangerous in the event of a car crash because most people don't secure it in the back. They just take the thing and they throw it in the footwell on the passenger side of the vehicle. And if you get in a car crash, this 15, well, it's not 15 pounds. It's, it's eight pounds maybe. Uh, this thing is flying around inside the car, <laughs> which is not something you want to be hit by while you're, you know, flying around in the car. So uh, know that, all right? Uh, professional car thieves, if they're going to, if, you know, if they see your car and your car is easy pickings, they're going to steal your car regardless. There isn't anything you can do about that. So anyway, uh, think about that. Uh, as I said uh, in the introduction when I was, or earlier when I was talking about car thefts, uh, the old buggy, the 1997 Honda CRV that I have, uh, it does have power locks on it, but the power locks, ah, eh, sometimes they're a bit goofy. So I need to walk around the vehicle and I physically check to make sure that all the doors are locked, all right? Now, the other piece that I was saying uh, was is that they have key fobs that they make up and they will drive through the neighborhoods and they will click the key fob. They will keep clicking it until they get one of the cars to open up. And uh, my mate, has had his truck broken into a couple of times and then they just go through and they steal whatever they can in the vehicle uh, once they get it open. So those are some of the ideas and thing tips about uh, car, thief, car thefts. But again, watch Gone in 60 Seconds with Nicolas Cage. You'll know what professional car thieves can do and how they steal, uh, steal cars, okay? So big business, professional car thieves, and they are well organized uh, and they know what they're targeting. Uh, I think in Canada some years ago, probably 10 years ago, I think the Ford F50 was the most stolen vehicle. And if you go on any uh, website, you just Google it, uh, they will tell you what are the most stolen cars uh, according to your area or place that you live and whatnot. So what documents you need to bring for your driver's test? Excellent question. Thank you for that, Adrian. Uh, the documents you need to bring, you need to bring three pieces of ID, uh, picture ID, preferably, okay, so a passport, uh, your driver's license. Now, every state, go into the handbook and they will have a list of the specific documents that you need to bring to apply for your driver's license. So don't think that you have the right documentation for the purposes of going in for your test, okay? So make sure that you go to the handbook and these are all available online. Uh, go over to the frequently asked questions on the Smart Drive Test website. We have links to all of the state manuals and just go into your state, look in the handbook and they will tell you specifically what documentation you need to bring. Uh, your social security card, uh, those types of things. Okay, some of it has to be picture IDs. Now, on the day of your driver's test, your actual on-road driver's test, not your learner's when you apply for your first license, but your uh, on-road driving test, make sure you bring your learner's license, uh, an extra piece of ID just in case they ask you for that, and bring money, okay? <laughs> the driver's license test is not free. You need to bring money, all right? Uh, bring your money and as well, bring your sunglasses, bring your prescription glasses if you need any of that. Now, the other piece about showing up for your on-road driver's test, make sure that you do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle the night before, okay? Don't show up because you will be denied. I Over the years, there have been a number of uh, people who showed up for a driver's test. Uh, they've been denied their driver's test because the seatbelt wasn't working on the passenger side of the vehicle. They didn't have the registration documents, uh, the 
insurance uh, was uh, had lapsed and had not been renewed. Uh, what other reasons? Other reasons uh, they've been denied driver's test. Uh, they borrowed their uncle's car from a different province or different state, and it didn't have a front license plate because Alberta, for example, doesn't require you to have a front license plate. But here in British Columbia, you have to have a front license plate, and the driving examiner will not take you out. And I know it's kind of a dick move. Uh, when you borrow your uncle's car from a different state and they won't let you take you out because it doesn't have a front license plate, that's not really a safety issue, but examiners can deny you for that, okay? So do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle the night before you show up for your driver's test. Make sure that everything is working, everything is safe. And there is a video here on the channel. Uh, Corey just put it up, he's ahead of me. Excellent, thank you for that, Corey. Uh, so do a pre-trip inspection and if you're going with a driving school, ask the driving instructor if he or she did a pre-trip uh, pre inspection on the vehicle before you show up for the test, okay? You don't want to be denied because you had a brake light out or the horn didn't work because they will do a mini pre-trip before you head out for the driver's test. They'll stand in front of the vehicle, they'll check the signals, they'll check the lights. If it's raining, they'll make sure that the windshield wipers work and uh, they'll go around the back of the vehicle to make sure the brake lights work. Uh, signals, uh, they'll get you to beep the horn. Uh, driver's door has, our passenger's door has to open, the passenger seat belt has to work, so make sure you check that as well uh, before you go down for your driver's test. And make sure that the registration and insurance is in the vehicle, okay? Bring money, yes, the police need it. Yes, so does the DMV and other government organizations. They all seem to be have their hand in your pocket taking out your money. So make sure that you bring all of that uh, when you show up. The other piece for your driver's test, make sure that you can turn on the defrost. And if it's summertime, make sure you can turn on the air conditioning because that will really, uh, you know, bode well for the driving examiner because you're keeping him or her comfortable during the drive uh, so defrost windshield wipers and washer fluid and high low beams okay driving examiners may or may not ask you to turn on those secondary controls so the secondary controls at minimum windshield wipers high low beam headlights and defrost in the car all right uh, emily in a car with an electronic parking brake where is my emergency brake and how does it work uh Emily, your electronic parking brake is your parking brake, okay? It is your emergency brake. Now, I don't know. I need to do a test on this. I need to do a video on this. Uh, whether these electric parking brakes now will actually stop the vehicle uh, going down the road. I don't know. But it is your parking brake. Now, the other piece and the piece on that that Emily just asked, which is a really great question. Yes, apply the parking brake every time you park the vehicle. And the reason we say that is because all modern vehicles, you can program it to automatically apply the parking brake uh, when you park the vehicle, okay? The transmission was mislabeled with the park gear, okay? It's not meant to hold the vehicle. The brakes are meant to hold the vehicle, not the transmission. Again, it comes back to the fundamentals of smarter defensive driving. You want a backup, okay? You want communication in tandem with your observation. You want the brakes to be holding the vehicle indefinitely when it's parked and you want the transmission as a backup, okay? Same thing as hill parking. You want the tire resting against the curb as a backup. You always want a backup, right? We need backups, we need fail safes. And this is what you need to do, creating skills, habits, and techniques when you're driving, when you're learning to drive, that are gonna keep you safe long-term. Maybe not next week, not six months from now, not six years from now, but maybe in eight years, it's gonna save your bacon and prevent you from having a serious crash. Uh, Roshan, when I am parking, I will always apply the parking brake. Awesome, my friend. Uh, Marion put parking brake on before you release the seat, your seat belt. <laughs> yes, indeed. And that's actually a really good habit because uh, if you go to get out of the vehicle and the seat belt still, you're like, oh, did I put the parking brake on? That's awesome advice. Uh, Mallory really amazes me how many people do not know uh, the move over law. And yes, uh, for those of you who may or may not know the move over law, emergency vehicles, uh, service vehicles that are working on the side of the road, slow down to 40 miles an hour, 60 kilometers an hour, or, and if you can on a multi-lane road, move over to the left lane to give them as much space as possible. And it's not just that it's a law, 
It's also your best defensive posturing because smarter defensive driving, the, one of the fundamental pillars, the three pillars of smarter defensive driving is to create space between you and other road users to keep yourself safe on the roadways, okay? Create space. The more space we have, the more time we have, the more time we have, the more options we have, and options prevent crashes, all right? Jackson, how are you, my friend? Awesome, Corey's put up the parallel park, two-point reverse turn, and the secret of uh, backing up in a straight line. Thank you for all of that, Corey. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Saren, do you have any tips on keeping your tires close to the curb while doing a parallel parking or backing around a curb? I'm in Washington State and I have to stay within 12 inches. Okay, yes. Uh, one of the things you want to do, Saren, is uh, look at that video that Corey just put up there, uh, learn the secrets to backing up straight along a curb and start with those skills and techniques. So the first thing you want to do is you want to be backing up in a straight line. You want to get control of the steering wheel, the brake, and the accelerator okay once you get that then you can start backing up in a straight line along a roadway and then uh the other uh, exercise that i show in the video is backing up along a pavement that has a gravel shoulder and you can back up along that and anytime you get off in the gravel you can hear it because the, the stones start to crackle underneath the tires and so that's another thing that you can do. And then finally back practice doing those other tips and getting uh, 12, eight to 12 inches from the curb. All of that is going to help you out. And the reason that you're having difficulty with that is that the passenger side of the vehicle is your second biggest blind area, okay? And you're dealing with that blind area and gotta kind of figure out where it is in, in you know, space and place. So do those exercises and that will really help you with getting 12 inches from the curb. Uh, Eric, uh, are there any tips to help with nerves? Uh, driving doesn't make me nervous. Driving in big, busy cities around other people makes me nervous. Yes, Erica, create the space in front of your vehicle, three to four second following distance, uh, stopping one vehicle length behind other traffic. Your landmark for that is being able to see the tires in, uh, on the, of the vehicle in front, making clear contact with the pavement. Breathing in through the nose, out through the mouth. Okay, relaxing and repeating the mantra to yourself. I am a safe driver. I am doing well, okay? All of this will help you to uh, reduce your nerves and your anxiety when you're driving in busy, congested traffic and know that you're doing well. But create that space in front of your vehicle because again, to repeat again, space buys you time, time buys you options, and options reduce crashes, reduce congestion, and all of those other things, okay? So have that space in front of your vehicle to drive well in the cities. Uh, Rawson, the Honda's doing well. <laughs> like I said, it had some major work done to it this week, and I'm gonna go off after the live stream going down and picking up from the shop. So hopefully we're into the last thing for the CRV for a couple hundred thousand kilometers. <laughs> That's what we're really hoping. Uh, Jackson, on my left or right, front tires as closest to the curb as possible. Okay, uh, thank you so much for the wonderful live stream tonight. Have a good week and you as well, Marion. Thank you so much, my friend. Uh, right, oh, excuse me. Hopefully you have a great week, Rick. Uh, times are tough, but we have to thrive and survive. Yes, we do. Awesome, awesome. Uh, Jackson, I have a trouble parking closer to the curb as possible. Okay, Jackson, it's just gonna be more and more practice. And the other piece that you can do is if you're having trouble with parking close to the curb, or those slow speed maneuvers, you can go and get some of those one meter, three feet tall delineators. You can rent them from any industrial rental shop and practice in a parking lot or other place where you can set the pylons up and do that as well. Because as I said, it's really tough because that's your passenger side. That's your biggest blind area on the vehicle. So you got to figure out kind of where your vehicle is in relationship to other things. And that's the area that needs uh, the most work because it's the toughest skill uh, when you're learning how to drive, okay? Excellent, lots of great questions tonight. Awesome, awesome live stream, okay? Uh, Pass your driver's test, first time course package is available over at the Smart Drive Test website. It's on sale for about 38 bucks right now, US, so have a look at that. Uh, consider purchasing that if you wanna be successful in passing your driver's test first time. All right, awesome live stream. Thanks for all the questions. Uh, good luck on your driver's test. For those of you who have a driver's test coming up, you passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks. Good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. 
Have a great night. Bye now.